Steve Barr hardly needs an introduction in the gathering of the Society of Catholic Scientists. He is uh, the president and founder uh, of it. He, was, uh, he is Professor Emeritus at the University of Delaware in Physics and Astronomy. He is uh, well known for his research in theoretical particle physics. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, and is, is uh, you know, known for his uh, work on grand unified theories, uh, CP violation, uh, neutrino oscillations, and particle cosmology. He's the author of many books, including uh, or set many publications and several books, including Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, which I showed on the screen earlier, which uh, I shall read. Um, Speaking of popes, uh, Pope Benedict XVI awarded uh, Steve Barr the ben Emerenti Medal in 2007, uh, and in 2010 he was elected member of the Academy of Catholic Theology, and he will tell us today about cosmic order, God, and the laws of physics. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for organizing this wonderful conference and, and this very nice venue. Uh, I might, before I get, begin my talk, give a, 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 my own uh, addendum to your answer to the first question. And that is, though we want to bring science and theology and philosophy into dialogue with each other, we don't want to redefine science, which I think was one of the concerns of the first question. That is, just as you know, St. Thomas distinguished sharply between theology and philosophy, each has its own methods. Uh, philosophy is done with the natural light of reason, theology has it's as, uh, the, the data of revelation. Science, theology, and philosophy each have its own, has its own methods and competences and ways of proceeding, and we don't want to bring divine revelation into the methodology of natural science. And so we do recognize the legitimate autonomy, as St. John Paul II said, of, of science. That now, now my talk. Um, Make sure I can advance the slides. Okay. Now, so from ancient times, um, I talked as well, as you see, cosmic order, um, God and the laws of physics. Now, from ancient times, uh, Christians have argued that the existence of God uh, can be known from his works. That is, creation itself points to its creator. This is clearly stated in scripture as in the beginning of Psalm uh, 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Uh, the Old Testament book of wisdom, which I quoted last night, says that from the, correspond from the pers uh, pers uh, greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. And this is echoed. This passage in wisdom is echoed by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, where he says that ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. This same theme uh, is taken up by early Christian writers, such as St. Irenaeus in the second century, who wrote, creation itself, reveals him who created it. And the work made is itself suggestive of him who made it, that made it. And the world manifests him that arranged it. So what is it about the created world, the natural world, that reveals God? Most fundamentally, of course, it is the very fact that the world exists at all. There is a universe but there didn't have to be. So the very existence of the universe must have a cause, a cause of being. This is the most fundamental fact about the world that points to its creator, but there is another fundamental fact about the world that also seems to call for an explanation, and that is the fact that the world is orderly. To quote St. Irenaeus again, there exists but one God. He is the Father, God, the Creator, the Author, the Giver of Order. This argument that the orderliness of the, cre of the, of the uh, cosmos points to a God who is the Giver of Order is repeated over and over by the theologians of the early church. To show how 
prominent this argument is in Catholic tradition, I'll quote from a number of, of these early Christian writers. So to quote Saint, uh, so uh, Minucius Felix, around 200 AD, who I quoted last night, when you see the providence order and law in the heavens and on earth, believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. The great theologian Origen, writing around 250 AD, said, when we are convinced by what we see in the excellent orderliness of the world, then we worship its maker as the one author of one effect, which since it is entirely in harmony with itself, cannot therefore have been the work of many makers. Lactantius, writing around 300 AD, said, there is no one so uncivilized or of such barbarous manners that he does not, when he raises his eyes to heaven, understand something from the very magnitude of things, their motion, arrangement, constancy, beauty, and proportion, and that this could not possibly be if it were not established in wonderful order, having been fashioned on some greater design. Saint Athanasius, writing shortly after that, said, <clears throat> creation as if in written characters and by means of its order and harmony declares in a loud voice its own master and creator. He went on to say, God by his own word, yes, God by his own word, gives to creation such order as is found therein, so that through it, through, that, so that though he is by nature invisible, men might be able to know him through his works. And we have a few more. St. Gregory of Nazianzus in the late fourth century says, wrote, let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? St. Gregory of Nyssa, writing around the same time, said, all creation, and above all, as the scripture says, the orderly arrangement of the heavens demonstrates the wisdom of the creator through the skill displayed in his works. And finally, St. Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the mid-fifth century, said, from the origination of the world, that is, as being, and from its order and beauty, we can recognize that the wisdom and power of him who created it and brought it into existence far surpasses every created mind. This argument, which you see throughout Christian history, is an example of what philosophers call the argument from design. Unfortunately, in recent years, the word design has been, uh, to a large extent, been taken over by something called the Intelligent Design Movement, or ID Movement, which started in the late 1990s. This movement issue, uses a specific kind of design argument to attack Darwinian evolution. I'm not going to discuss evolution further in this talk, except to say that the Catholic Church has never condemned evolution, never condemned evolution, and does not oppose it. Uh, I do, however, want to point out three ways in which the ID movement's arguments differ from the more ancient argument for a giver of order uh, that we saw in the passages I just quoted from early Christian writers. First, the ID movement looks for evidence of design only, at least primarily, in phenomena that they think have no natural explanation. That is, in things that they think go beyond the powers or capacities of nature. By contrast, the more ancient argument uh, is based on the orderliness of nature itself. Both Holy Scripture and Catholic tradition generally cite perfectly natural phenomena as evidence of a creator, because nature itself and its lawful order come from God. Second, the ID movement focuses exclusively or almost exclusively on biological phenomena, and in particular on the structures of living things. One sees, however, that the ancient argument is based on the order of the whole cosmos, 
both living things and non-living things, both the earth and the heavens, all of creation points to its creator. Rather than traditional, the traditional emphasis being on biology, scripture and early Christian writers most commonly emphasized the heavens. They most commonly pointed to the heavens. Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. Minucius Felix extols the providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth. Lactantius refers to what we see when we raise our eyes to heaven. St. Athanasius speaks of the orderly arrangement of the heavens, and so on. But again, it is all parts of creation that reflect the creator. And third, the ID movement focuses entirely on the complexity of living things, or parts of living things. The specified complexity, or what they call irreducible complexity. Uh, whereas the central theme of the ancient Christian writings was on the or was not on complexity, it was on the order, beauty, harmony, and lawfulness of the world. So to avoid being hung up on the word design and the baggage which that word has now unfortunately acquired, let me call the more ancient argument the argument from order. Now How, how has the argument from order held up in light of modern science? I'm going to argue that it has held up very well indeed. The discoveries of modern science cannot undermine it fundamentally for the simple reason that all of modern science, all explanations in modern science are based upon the fact that nature is orderly and lawful which is also the premise of the argument from order. In fact, the discoveries of modern physics by revealing cosmic order to be much more profound and impressive than had previously been imagined has, have enormously strengthened this ancient argument. The more we discover, the stronger it becomes. Modern atheists and materialists would disagree with this, of course, and they have intelligent reasons for disagreeing with this. Their point is that if you look at the orderly arrangements or shapes of things seen in the natural world, one finds that they do not come from someone arranging them or shaping them by hand, so to speak, or, to, or as in the case of human artifacts. Rather, they arise spontaneously <coughs> through blind and impersonal natural forces and mechanisms. No organizing intelligence or giver of order is needed. For example, if we see a human artifact that is, has a spherical shape, such as a billiard ball, we know that someone has chosen to give it that shape, some agent, some but stars and planets are spherical, or very nearly spherical, because their gravitational self-attraction squeezes them into spheres. If we see soldiers arranged in a regular array on a parade ground, or chairs arranged in a regular array in an auditorium, we know that this is due to human choice. But when liquids freeze, their molecules, which had been moving around randomly in the liquid, spontaneously arrange themselves into the regular arrays we call crystals. There are some nice ones. Good. And this happens not because someone is there arranging the molecules one at a time by hand, it's by the operation of chemical forces. Now, or consider the orderly, very orderly structure of the solar system. The orbits of the planets all lie more approximately in the same plane. That's a remarkable thing. The planets all go around the sun in the same direction. And the planets have elliptical or or orbits. They're all quite close to being circles. These impressive geometrical patterns 
uh, were not imposed by hand, though actually Newton thought they had been originally uh, by the Creator, but we know that they weren't imposed by hand. We know that the solar system started as a chaotically swirling cloud of gas and dust, we believe that, and that its orderly arrangement emerged gradually through physical mechanisms that are well understood. And indeed, this seems to be the story of the whole history of the universe, the whole the story of the universe. The whole universe in its early stages was filled with a nearly uniform, featureless gas of elementary particles. This gas grew more lumpy as gravity enhanced the slight density fluctuations in it. These fluctuations presumably produced by quantum fluctuations in the early universe. These lumps eventually condensed into ga galaxies and then stars and planets. Somewhere on the surface of the Earth, um, there was a soup of simple chemicals early on. And these chemicals clumped together under the influence of electromagnetic forces into smaller and then larger molecules, until at last molecules that could replicate themselves appeared. This led eventually to the emergence of self-replicating cells and then to multicellular organisms, and then even more complex organisms with nervous systems and brains evolved and so forth. So this is the grand picture that the uh, atheist would point to, of order emerging spontaneously from chaos, form from formlessness. And presiding over the whole drama, we are told, is not some intelligence, but blind physical forces and mathematical necessity. Now, while this account of cosmic history is correct as far as it goes, it's incomplete. The lesson that the atheist draws from it are based on a superficial view of, the, of science. It's a view that really leaves out a great deal and a major part of what science has taught us about nature, maybe the most important part. What it leaves out is this. When examined carefully, accounts and explanations of natural processes are never really about order spontaneously emerging from mere chaos, or form emerging from mere formlessness. On the contrary, these accounts are always about the unfolding of a pre-existing deeper order, an order that was already present in the nature of things, although often in a hidden way. So in physics, when we see situations that appear to be entirely haphazard, amorphous, chaotic, automatically or spontaneously arranging themselves, into intricate orderly patterns, we find that every case that what appeared to be entirely amorphous or chaotic actually had a great deal of order already built into it. I'm going to illustrate this with a simple but very instructive, I think, example. And what we're going to learn from this little example is the following important principle. Order has to be built in already for order to come out. Now here's the example. Let's imagine that we have a box, like a shoe box, with some ball bearings in it, rolling around in the bottom. And the, if the ball bearings will tend to have a rather random distribution and roll around aimlessly. But if we tilt the box slightly, the ball bearings will all roll into one corner and we'll see a pattern emerge, at least if we jiggle the box around a little bit. And you can do this, or if you played those little games, we have to get the ball bearings in the little holes. You will have seen this. What emerges is this pattern, which is called the hexagonal closest packing pattern. This is the tightest way to pack spheres. Here are some examples of spheres packed in this way. Oranges on a fruit stand, insect eggs on a leaf. But let's go back to the ball bearings in the box. I, I said, as I said, they arrange themselves into that pattern just when you jiggle the box. Unlike the oranges in the fruit stand where an intelligent agent 
place them by hand, deliberately, in that pattern. Now, the ball bear why do the ball bearings do this? Well, they do it because of two things. One, the force of gravity, which pulls the ball bearings down to the corner and tries to make them pack as tightly as possible. And second, it's a mathematical fact that the tightest way to pack spheres is the hexagonal array. But let's think a little harder about what's going on. Suppose that instead of ball bearings in a box, I did the same thing to my living room. I, I hire a huge crane to come and tilt my living room and shake it around until everything falls into a corner. Now what's going to emerge? I would not end up with an orderly pattern like this, but a jumbled heap of lamps, furnitures, furniture, books, toys, and so on. Now I hasten to say that this is not my living room. Uh, I got this off the internet, but it well illustrates that it's not exactly a nice geometrical pattern. Now why don't the ball bearings form a jumbled heap like this? Well, there are several reasons. First, unlike the objects in that room, every ball bearing has exactly the same shape and size. But that is in itself not enough to explain why they form an orderly pattern, because I could take other shaped objects, like spoons. If you look closely, they're not actually all identical, but they're pretty identical, close. I take a bunch of identical spoons, all the same shape and size, and put them in a box and shake it. I'm going to end up with a jumbled heap. And so there's another feature that the ball bearings had. First, they all have a, exactly the same size and shape, but they also have a very special shape of a sphere, which is the most symmetrical three-dimensional shape. Now the thing about a sphere, it, about the, the thing about the spoons here is that when you, they fall randomly into the corner of the box, they'll all end up pointing in different directions. But the thing about a sphere is a sphere can't point in a direction because no matter what way you turn it, it looks exactly the same. So no matter how the ball bearings fall into the corner, they can't point every which way. So the symmetry of the sphere is one of the key factors in, in the orderly arrangement one finds. Now, we see that, therefore, that even when the ball bearings are rolling around, and if you're just fixated on and focusing on how they're moving in the box and their arrangement as they're rolling around, you get the impression of mere chaos. And you more closely, you notice these orderly features of these objects, that they're spheres, that they're identical. And look more closely, of course, you see that there's a law of gravity and laws of physics governing this, which, of course, are not. Intent, not visible, but they're also principles of order. They're operating even when the ball bearings are rolling around, the law of gravity. Uh, in fact, the law of what, why is it that they fall into the corner? As I said, they're trying to, gravity's pulling them down. The ball bearings are, to anthropomorphize them, trying to lower as much as possible their gravitational potential energy. But that's due to underlying mathematical principles of order. So here we see how order came out. Order came from order. But it's even more interesting than that. As I'll now explain in this example, the order that emerged was in a certain sense less than the order that was already there. Now some of the order that we're talking about in this case is of the kind that mathematicians and physicists call symmetry. Symmetry plays a crucial, a central role in modern physics. To a mathematician or a physicist, a symmetry is a transformation of something that's done. It's an action that leaves something looking the same as it did before. For instance, if you take a perfect square and you rotate it by 90 degrees, or any multiple of 90 degrees, it looks the same as before. So the act of rotating by 90 degrees, that transformation, is a symmetry of the square. Now consider the six gray circles in the center of this hexagonal pattern. This is the pattern the ball bearings form. This, the gray hexagon in the middle has a six-fold symmetry. If you rotate it by any multiple of 60 degrees, it, it, the hexagon does not change. Therefore, the hexagon has six so-called rotational symmetries, rotating by 60, 120, 180, 240, 300, or 360 degrees. Now, this is a kind of, this kind of symmetry 
is the one we saw in the ball bearing example. And it emerged, it wasn't the six-fold symmetry before they tilted the box, but now suddenly it's there. Where did it come from? Well, the order that we said was already present in the shapes of the individual ball bearings, even in the chaotic situation, also involves symmetries. Now, with a, ball, with a sphere, it has rotational symmetries, but not just six of them, because you can rotate a sphere by any angle around any axis. So in a certain sense, it has a doubly infinite number of symmetries. We, say that we, we talk about the group of symmetries of an object. So the hexagon has a symmetry group, which has, uh, actually it has, it has D6 is the name of it. Uh, but there's a symmetry of a sphere is a much, much larger group of symmetries, which is called SO3. Now, what's important is that the six-fold symmetry, in a sense, that emerged is a remnant of the spherical symmetry of the spheres. What really happened was that, the, not that this, when one thinks about it carefully, is not that the six-fold symmetry that came out when you tilted the box, not that it came out of nowhere, it actually was distilled from the larger symmetry of the shape of the sphere. So this is an example of what we call, in various branches of physics, spontaneous symmetry breaking. A larger symmetry, a subset of a larger group of symmetries was manifested in the arrangement of things that come out. Okay, so symmetry is not created out of thin air. It is broken off, in a sense, broken down from a larger pre-existing symmetry. And this happens, this is sort of an example, this is the same kind of thing happens when crystals form. There, it's not a case of trying to minimize the gravitational potential energy, but the atoms or molecules are trying to minimize their free energy. But it's the same basic idea. So when you freeze a liquid and the molecules arrange themselves, as they do, into crystals, it's simply a, the deeper symmetry at the level of the atoms is manifesting itself in the shape of the crystal. Now, and atoms themselves, so here's the simplest atom, a hydrogen atom, and this is a picture of the different energy levels of the hydrogen atom, the density, the electron uh, density function for the different levels. And you see that even something as simple as a hydrogen atom has a great deal of symmetry in it. Now, let's consider the order in the heavens, which impressed early Christian writers. Well, they were impressed by it even before they knew about the uh, discoveries of Kepler and, and, and later uh, science. So much, but much of the symmetry, much of the orderliness of the heavens was known to the ancient astronomers. And then, of course, we learned much more, starting with Kepler. Now, if you look at that example also, you see that uh, much of the order the Kepler discovered, so, uh, as I talked about last night, Kepler discovered three additional uh, orderly patterns that had not been known to ancients, uh, his three laws of planetary motion, and then those patterns were shown to be a consequence of deeper order at the level of Newtonian mechanics and gravity, which itself was a consequence of the deeper order at the level of general relativity, and so on. Now, at every level, and again, I emphasized this in my talk last night, one finds that the, level, uh, the order at the deeper level is more impressive in some way, more beautiful than the order at the more superficial level. But even uh, at the level that Kepler was able to access, uh, the order is very beautiful indeed. And he said in one of his prayers, uh, I thank you, Lord God, our creator, that you have allowed me to see the beauty in your work of creation. And that when it comes down to what may be the deepest level, of order, uh, super uh, string theory possibly. One of the top physicists in the world in speaking about super string theory to a science journalist said, I don't think that I've succeeded in conveying to you its wonder, incredible consistency, remarkable elegance, and beauty. Now one of Kepler's laws is that the orbits of the planets around the sun are not exact circles, but ellipses with the sun at one of the focal points of the ellipse. Now ellipses are 
there are curves with many elegant mathematical properties, which were known and studied by ancient Greek mathematicians. But the elliptical shape of the planetary orbits is a consequence, we now know, of something at the level of Newton's laws. It's a direct consequence of the fact discovered by Newton that the law of gravity obeys an inverse square law. Now that fact, that the law of gravity, the gravity obeys an inverse square law, in turn is a consequence at a deeper level, level of field theory, of the fact that the gravitational field is what we now call a massless field. And the fact that the gravitational field is a massless field is a consequence of a deeper fact uh, that Einstein's theory of gravity is based on certain symmetry principles such as general coordinate invariance and local Lorentz invariance. So you can trace the order that Kepler could see about the ellipses down to deeper and deeper levels to various symmetry principles that operate at the deeper levels. So the order apparent is, again, on the surface of phenomena can be traced, traced down to deeper and deeper levels. And what one always finds at least so far is that the, the order you find at the deeper level is greater than the order manifested at the more superficial levels. Now, and now what's true of the motions of the heavenly bodies is also true of the study of matter itself. Now, as physicists probed beneath the surface to find the ultimate constituents of matter and the forces by which they interact, they discovered laws that were of astonishing subtlety, governed by mathematical principles and symmetries much stranger and more sophisticated than any that had been seen before in nature. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity, special relativity, is as general relativity, is based on a deep symmetry principle of space-time, that space-time itself has a kind of rotational symmetry. It involves symmetries not only that rotate in space, but symmetries that rotate time and space. And this, this set of symmetries is called the Lorentz symmetry, the Lorentz symmetry group. There's rotations that involve space and time, are ones that we can't visualize. The ones we can visualize, the spatial rotations, go around in circles, but the, space, the rotations in space-time involve time, in a sense, go around in hyperbole. We can't visualize those. We didn't evolve to be able to visualize the geometry of space-time. Um, the so-called, the, the, what we believe to be the fundamental, at this stage, in our present theory, the basic forces of nature, are all based, electromagnetism, the weak interaction, strong interaction, and gravity, not the Higgs force as far as we know, but the other forces are all based on deep symmetry principles called gauge symmetry. In fact, each of those forces only exists as a consequence of symmetry. And these gauge symmetries involve rotations in abstract so-called internal spaces that are very peculiar. That these are rotations in spaces whose coordinates are complex numbers. So the strong interactions, which Chris Lee studies, are based on a symmetry called SU3, which involves rotations in an abstract three-dimensional space of three complex dimensions. In grand unified theories, on which I did a lot of work, um, of which, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, that the three non-gravitational forces are really remnant, broken parts of a deeper force called the grand unified force through spontaneous symmetry breaking. These grand unified forces are based on gauge symmetries that are more strange still. The, the simplest grand unified theories involve rotations either in five complex dimensions or 10 real dimensions. And you can't visualize these things. Um, here, there's a diagram. Oops, wait a minute. I guess I don't have that, do I? No. Oh, there, that's the quote from Kepler. Here's a diagram that has something to do with a grand unified group. But it, it, the grand, as I said, you can't actually visualize the grand unified transformations themselves because they take place in larger numbers of dimensions that we can visualize, and dimensions involve complex numbers. There's an indirect evidence that the inner structure of matter involves a kind of symmetry 
that goes even, that's even stranger called supersymmetry. And the mathematics of supersymmetry uses numbers that are even more remote from our experience than complex numbers. They use what are called Grassmann numbers. Both real numbers and complex numbers have the intuitive property A times B equals B times A. But for Grassmann numbers, A times B is minus B times A, which has the consequence if you set A equal to B, A times A is minus A times A, so A times A is zero. So any Grassmann number times itself is zero. These are very strange numbers about which we have no intuition. Now, even if supersymmetry is not a part of nature, Grassmann numbers also play a role in describing the behavior of uh, fermions, such as electrons. In, in the fields that describe electrons are basically Grassmannian fields. So we see that as we probe deeper and deeper into nature, we see more rich, more rich mathematical structure, more rich symmetries that go beyond the power of human beings to visualize or have intuitive uh, intuition about, we have to use the tools of mathematics to study them. So, but the point is, and the same, by the way, is true of the other kind of order. Not all the order in nature is symmetry. Symmetry is a nice example because it's easy to visualize examples of symmetry. But there are also the dynamical principles that govern the world. Uh, and those also involve are principles of order. Uh, such as the principles of the classical physics, the principle of least action, or the principle which tells you that things would minimize their gravitational energy, and, it, and at a more deeper level, the principles of quantum mechanics. But the point is that science does not ever, as I say, explain away the order in nature, but it always explains order at one level as coming from a deeper level of order. And when physics has done its job, as far as, far as let's say, fundamental physics is concerned, it hopes to find the, the ultimate or fundamental laws of physics, which we don't yet know. Once we know the ultimate, or if we ever know the ultimate laws of physics, then fundamental physics has done its job. That, everything points to the fact that that ultimate theory, whatever it is, will be very rich mathematics have a tremendous, exhibit tremendous mathematical order. Where does that come from? You can't appeal to a deeper level because by assumption that is the fundamental level. So either you simply have to say that order is a brute fact with no explanation, and certainly physics itself doesn't explain that. It can't by its, the way it proceeds. Or you say there's a giver of order. Those are really the only two options. They're both logically consistent. You can say the ultimately the order in nature is just a brute fact, which we have to accept, or you can say that there's an explanation for it. But in the end, we're left with the same question that St. Gregory of Nazianzus asked. Let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? And this is a question I think that many Scientists never ask themselves, in my experience, many, especially atheist ones. Atheists will appeal to the laws of physics. But a question that I've never heard them ask is why are there laws of physics? They go through a whole career studying the laws in all their magnificence and somehow never ask, why are there these laws? And at least the Christian has an answer, the answer given by St. Irenaeus. There is a giver of order. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for this beautiful talk. And open the floor to questions. If there's none, OK, there's two of them. OK, I'm not a scientist, so forgive me. Simplicity of the question, but at this point in physics, what constitutes evidence? It's not something I can see. It's not something I can measure, or even beyond I can measure the effects, so therefore X must exist. What do you got to prove? 
Okay, in physics, so this is the whole area of philosophy of science, which is a huge area of, of um, study. You're right, we don't have proof. In natural science, we don't talk about proofs generally. Uh, proofs you have in mathematics, possibly in philosophy. We talk about evidence. We talk about what philosophers nowadays call uh, reasoning to the best explanation. For the, so what you have is a set of data. You have a set of facts. And you try to find a set of hypotheses that are reasonably simple and few in number that will explain a large number of facts. So you, you're trying to find an economical set of assumptions that, when accepted, give you an explanation of a very large number of, and variety of facts. And if you can do that, and you try to find the best such explanation, so you're reasoning to the best explanation. And uh, it's not, it doesn't give you the kind of what philosophy called metaphysical certitude uh, that you might get from a mathematical proof. It's more like what's done in a courtroom. You're presented with a lot of facts. It can be physical facts and DNA or bloody knives or blood spatter on the ceiling or whatever. And uh, all sorts of facts about people's motives and character and, their, and so forth. And there are a lot of different kinds of facts. Witnesses, sometimes eyewitnesses, maybe not. And you try to find some theory of the case that accounts for all of them, or nearly all of them, in, a, in the most economical way. And that's, and, and you sometimes come to the conclusion that certain events must have happened that you have no direct access to. You don't have a, 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 a security camera showing you the actual act, but you infer that it happened indirectly. And so in science, and this is actually an important point, in science, you are inferring Thing of, uh, making inferences about things that you do not directly observe from the things you do. And this is kind of like what St. Paul was talking about. You are reasoning from certain things you do see, the created world. You are making inferences about what you don't see, which is the God who created. It's a little bit different because in the case of the criminal investigation, the things you don't see are physically are physical causes, as I talked about last night. Because God is not a part of the universe. He's not a part of this world. So he's, he's a different kind of a cause. But you are reasoning from the seen to the unseen, also in science, in many cases. But maybe I should leave it there. Either. I can add one comment to your answer. Is that another uh, way to uh, give evidence that one of our scientific hypotheses or is, is, is likely to correct, but it also makes predictions of other facts that we haven't seen yet. And if then we go out and look for them and find them, and we take that as evidence that that explanation is... That's huge. <laughs> a huge part of the answer, yeah, which I've forgotten. <laughs> the question? Well, yeah. That kind of reasoning, I think, is uh, absolutely uh, the way we do things. Is that how theologians came up with original sin? Well, partly. So what theologians do so in, in natural science, we have the data of experiment or observation. Data meaning that which is given. That's the literal meaning of data, right. the things that are given. We, don't, we do question the data because sometimes experiments are done wrong. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're fairly convinced the experiment was done right, the data is something you have to accept. It's given. It's, it's, and your theory has to accommodate it somehow. With, uh, in theology, the data is the data of revelation. But the theologian is trying to take the data of revelation and show that it give the, uh, theological explanations that show that it allow us to understand how that data fits together in a coherent way with itself, with the different revealed truths, how they fit together, how the revealed truths fit together with what we know on other grounds, like the natural reason and science and so forth experience, an everyday experience, uh, and from history and so forth, uh, and maybe with philosophical truth. So yes, um, theologians in a sense operate in the same way. They're coming up with theories to try, they go try to fit the data points. And so um, that's how it also works with, with original sin. Just to follow on that, uh, in science you come up with a theory 
Right. And everyone admits it's probably not quite right, but it fits the data pretty well, right. and we keep working on it. Why wouldn't the church say that about original sin? It does. I thought it said you had to believe it. No, there are things like that. that okay. Now, with the church, the church... Um, how much, do I have two minutes? Five minutes? Sure. Yes. Well, the church um, is, we believe, the church asserts of itself, and we Catholics believe that the church has a certain authority, in a sense, or power, to declare what it believes. So the church has received this revelation from Christ, handed down in tradition and the scripture and so forth. And if the church has the power, when push comes to shove, when an issue has arisen which has to be resolved, to say, this is what we believe. This is what we believe, not this. So, and it doesn't do that very often, but it does have the power, in a sense, to declare its faith uh, in an irrevocable way. So the church, and so it does that through dogmatic definitions from time to time. So the church, you know, has made certain dogmatic pronouncements about the nature of Christ, about the Trinity, and so forth that the church cannot go back on because it sort of committed itself to that. Uh, and that is true of some things about original sin. But that doesn't mean that you've exhausted the subject. There are certain things you have to say about original sin because the church has, has declared those to be de fide in the Catholic Council of Trent. But, that, that, but there's many, many questions about original sin that haven't been resolved. The, fact, the, the dogmatic pronouncements and the, 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 are, are, the, are the data points, but they don't constitute the smooth curve. <laughs> if it goes through all the points, there's a lot of room for intellectual exploration. The behavior of three and four-year-olds is strong evidence for the existence of original sin. Take one final question before the coffee break. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Sure, because this will save me time in my talk later by asking you now, Steve. Yeah. So, so I just want to quickly go back. You know, your your original comment to the earlier question, I totally agree with. Right, we're not trying to redefine science. Right. Right. But I I think you showed something in your talk that maybe just I, I'm curious another comment on. You know, one of the challenges is both I think Catholics on average and scientists, particularly atheists, do not have a deep sort of familiarity with either philosophy or theology anymore because they're not practiced by singular individuals. They become, you know, Chris, as you pointed out, all very much harder, more specialized. And so you get kind of the superficial philosophical applications that you were talking to yes. in this by atheist scientists that on the surface seem very reasonable and are easy to convince people are true because they sound reasonable. and. People don't have the skills and education in philosophy, theology, theology to go to the deeper level you just did. Right. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts in a world where you know we're not going to go back where every scientist is also a philosopher in theology. The fields are too broad, too deep. Right. But how do we sort of help educate everybody in all three of these better? Right. I mean, I'm not sure about practically how we do this, like writing and speaking and so on. Right. But, but you're right. You know, what I, I didn't. I, so I think they have. They are in contact. And, and scientists are human beings, and they, but when they're doing their science professionally, there's certain rules. Right. But, they, but, they, but of course, they, have, they think about the science they're doing. And they can't actually isolate the science from the philosophy. Right. So for example, in, in critical moments in scientific history, at big junctures, there have been philosoph philosophy has affected science. So a good example is quantum mechanics, where Einstein had certain philosophical convictions that the world, the laws of physics should be deterministic in nature. And that was a philosophical conviction which made it so that he could not accept the Copenhagen and the traditional interpretation of quantum mechanics. He never accepted it. So philo philosophical stances actually do believe, affect how science is done. And there's an example that I can talk about, I won't run time now, but the whole question of anthropic coincidences. Uh, there was a time, uh, 30 years ago, it, it was very hard to get a paper published talking about the coincidences. Not talking about the God might be involved, just talking about the coincidences themselves. I wrote a paper that, that actually is now, well, in 19, the first person who sort of broke the ice was able to write a paper about anthropic coincidences was Steven Weinberg, who's an atheist. He wrote a very important paper in 1989. 
1998, some colleagues and I, and the four of us included an atheist and a Catholic, and I don't know what the other two are, uh, wrote a paper about a key question in particle physics, and we talked about it from an anthropic point of view. The referees, this is, we submitted it to physical review, which is, which is not that hard to get into. <laughs> and the referees gave positive reports, but the editor, who will remain nameless, vetoed the paper. He said, I'm taking the almost unprecedented step of overruling the referees and vetoing this paper. And he wrote this 10-page screed, diatribe, about how our paper was not science. It, it, it would turn science back more than 400 years. Now, as many people do, we have condensed our paper and submitted a version of PRL, if it's read letters, which is much harder to get into. One of the referees of the PRL was Steven Weinberg. <laughs> Both referees, including Steven Weinberg, gave it glowing. They said it should be published in PRL. At that point, the editor of FizRev, which is published by the same people who published FizRev Letter, was in an untenable position, and he reversed himself, and the paper was published. But this shows how philosophical prejudice, because that was the editor, gave philosophical reasons for rejecting our papers. But you can't insulate, actually, the practice of science in every case from philosophy. Um, but anyway, that paper, which is not even science, is now, I think it's got close to, I think it has over 250 citations, and it's been cited by lots of top people in the field. So the philosophical prejudices do. But this also illustrates that over time, the science tends to overcome the philosophical prejudices. Yeah. It, 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 in the long run, scientists have philosophical prejudices. But in the long run, this, this, the science tends to prevail over them. Yeah. So we as Catholic scientists should pray for the soul of Stephen. <laughs> <laughs>